presentation. So that's my pleasure to introduce you the next speaker. He's a very real expert in the, in the topic of diabetology. His works began as so early as 1974, and since that, uh, that moment he has published about 400 papers related with this topic, and uh, I think it's a real enormous amount of publications. So um, I must say also that he is from Austria, Vienna, and he, he likes a lot, uh, and he's an expert in fine arts, music, theater, and of course, as an Austrian, he's an expert in ski, he was an, an instructor, and that is a problem for me because um, my, broken, my, my knee was broken one and a half years ago. <laughs> so okay. it's my pleasure to, to introduce Professor Gurtram Esrentaner, that he's talking about optimizing glycemic control in diabetic patients with unstable and stable coronary artery disease. Thank you, Guntram. Many thanks for a nice introduction. Unfortunately, I have to leave punctually at 4 o'clock since I have to fly from uh, to your airport to Marseille for another lecture tomorrow morning. I cannot miss the flight. I'm very sorry. We have a little bit delayed. So uh, my question is relatively simple. I have to talk about specific anti-diabetic interventions in patients with acute myocardial infarction or in those with a history of myocardial infarction. And unfortunately, uh, despite that this uh, occurrence is quite uh, often, we have very few studies, unfortunately. And uh, for macrovascular disease, we have only one specific study, but we will have uh, a second one very soon on June 9th, presented at the ADA. I'm also involved in this study. So the TIGAMI-1 study is the first study done by my friends from Karolinska Hospital by uh, Lars Rieden and Klaas Malmberg. And what they did is uh, very interesting. They randomized about 300 patients to either insulin glucose infusion therapy or to conventional therapy. And as you can see, they had an HbA1c at baseline at that time was quite high. This was uh, about uh, 17 years ago. It was 8% in the control group and 8.2% in the uh, intervention group. As you can see here, the long-term mortality was quite different. So the infusion uh, study uh, resulted in a risk reduction of 28%, which was quite nice. And the absolute risk reduction was 11%. At that time, all uh, clinics in the world started with insulin therapy in this situation since at that time it was believed insulin is the solution. But it became clear from the beginning that it was unclear whether it was insulin or it was the type of intervention since unfortunately there was a significant difference in the metabolic control uh, between the two arms. So it is... Uh, uh, very important that the same scientists continued working with a second study, which is normally not the case. Normally doing one study and you are happy this is the end of the story. So they did a second study and the second study arrived at totally different results. What they did is quite nice. They randomized now to three groups. One was the intensive group. Uh, another one was the uh, acute insulin group, but continued by conventional insulin. And one was conventional insulin, mainly conventional therapy, mainly metformin and sulfonurias. So the difference between green and yellow is, you see, acute insulin infusion was used in both at about 94%, but then in the uh, yellow arm, there was a continuation subcutaneous insulin at discharge only in 45, 45%, whereas the green arm continued with 84%. Of course, there were more hypoglycemias associated with intensive insulin therapy and more weight gain, but this is common uh, uh, fact. So you see here now, they had a clear difference to the old study. In the old study, they had an HbA1c of 8%, 8.2%. Here, only 7.2%. So uh, the authors uh, showed very similar improvement in the three arms. That's very important for understanding the results. The same is the case for fasting plasma glucose. And here you see the results. So unfortunately, the most intensive group in green did not show the best results. Fortunately, the risk increase by 34% and 36% did not reach levels of significance, but it was a clear signal that the intensive insulin treatment was not the better choice. 
So this is the summary of the data. So there was no difference in mortality between the intensive and conventional group. However, stroke occurred more often, 42% uh, increase in the intensive insulin arm, not reaching levels of significance. And uh, there was also no significant increase in the reinfarction rate. But, and this is important, the uh, effect of statins and beta blocking agents was confirmed. Metformin had no effect. And as in the Australian study, uh, which I show in a second, there was a clear um, uh, signal that uh, per 60 milligram deciliter fasting glucose, there was an increased risk of 20% mortality. So glucose is important, but the question is which type of intervention is the best one. So the authors made many publications, follow-up publications. So these are the three years. And now they looked for insulin-treated, non-insulin-treated patients. Why? There was an overlap among the three groups. And when they uh, looked only for insulin and not insulin-treated patients, then they realized that the insulin-treated group, the patients are mainly insulin-resistant, as you heard from Peter Grant before, the insulin-treated patients had a higher rate of non-fatal reinfarction and stroke in the follow-up compared to the patients not on insulin. And uh, in this uh, uh, analysis published by Linda Melpin in the European Heart Journal, it became also clear that insulin uh, changed the situation on, on the, the negative side, whereas metformin was quite positive and sulfonuria had no effect at all. So recently, Linda uh, published a five-year follow-up in Diabetologia, and it became clear that the mortality rate is still high in the diabetic patients, despite uh, that we are living in the 21st century. And uh, insulin treatment now was significantly associated with non-fatal cardiovascular events, but not with mortality. Metformin was associated with significantly lower mortality rate and lower risk of death from malignancies. And the authors concluded patients with type 2 diabetes and myocardial infarction have a poor prognosis, even today with the use of statins, beta-blocking agents, and antiplatelet drugs. And glucose-lowering drugs appear to be of prognostic importance. Insulin may be associated with an increased risk of non-fatal cardiac events, while metformin seems to be protective against risk of death. I do not know many groups in the world who are doing a second study and showing totally different uh, results from the first one. I, I feel this is uh, very important, and I like these people very much. So you see here the data. For mortality was no difference, but uh, when you are comparing with the non-insulin-treated patients, then you see a doubling in reinfarction rate, in the rate of reinfarction and stroke, and also in the combined endpoint of death, stroke, and reinfarction. Let's move now from cold Scandinavia to the very hot Australia. Uh, this is a study done in 2006, published in 2006. It's a much smaller study in 240 patients with acute myocardial infarction. They also used intensive insulin infusion in the infarction patients and uh, most had diabetes, but not all. Some had high blood glucose levels at diagnosis of myocardial infarction. And as you can see, insulin dextrose infusion did not reduce mortality in inpatient stage, and not after three months, and uh, at six months uh, there was a trend. However, and this is important, there was a lower incidence of cardiac failure, 13% versus 23%, and there was also a difference, a clear difference in reinfarction within three months, 2.4 versus 6.1%. Here you see the data uh, in hospital mortality, here the three months data, and then the six months mortality, and when the authors looked for patients with uh, mean blood glucose values, this is the mean values of eight measurements per day, for example. Then there was a clear difference uh, between those reaching uh, uh, mean blood glucose levels lower or higher than eight millimole per liter. As you can see, there was a clear difference in the three months mortality, and in particular in the six months mortality, 2% versus 11%. Let's move to another study. This study was organized in Jerusalem by Itamaras. This is the HART2T study. 
since many years it was discussed whether prandial insulin, prandial glucose, sorry, postprandial glucose is more important than fasting. Why? The patients are starting with postprandial. And in the prediabetic phase, postprandial glucose is always much more significantly associated with complications than fasting, whereas in the advanced stage of type 2 diabetes, this is uh, uh, rather unclear. So what they did is also quite nice. They randomized more than 1,000 patients after acute myocardial infarction, either to a prandial uh, insulin strategy or to a basal insulin strategy. And these were the outcomes. So you see here the blood glucose values during the day before the intervention and here after the intervention. So there was a difference in the fasting state as well as in the postprandial state, but not as good as wished. And it's very difficult to design a study arriving at the same HbA1c decrease, but with very clear differences in the fasting and postprandial state. It's almost impossible in my opinion. I was one of the reviewers and I predicted it will be very difficult to make this study. So uh, at the end, there was no difference in the overall group in the cardiovascular mortality or the cardiovascular outcome, combined outcome between prandial and basal group. But, and this is quite interesting, when they look to the elderly patients, they had more um, uh, inflammation than were more ill. Then uh, became a clear difference, as you can see here. So uh, the prandial insulin had a much better outcome compared to the basal insulin. And this is also interesting for the uh, uh, new uh, origin study, which will be published in New England uh, uh, Journal of Medicine in June of this year. So let's move now to the advanced stage, to the uh, uh, overt coronary or cardiovascular disease, which uh, landmark studies do we have for glycemic control? A number. Uh, I will not go to all of them, but we'll show a few uh, slides from some of these studies. So in the advanced accord and veteran study, there was a nice reduction of HbA1c after three, four, or five years, as you can see here. They did not reach lower than 6%. It's almost impossible. But what they did, they used too many drugs. No expert in diabetology would use so many drugs, insulin, uh, GLP-1 agonists, and three or even five anti-diabetic drugs together. So probably they had a problem with hypoglycemia. You see here, as already mentioned by Peter, that about one third of the patients had already cardiovascular disease. They had long diabetes duration of about 10 years. And when you're looking to the primary outcome, to the primary cardiovascular outcome, then you can see they all move to the correct direction, lowering of 10, 6, and 13 percent, but did not reach levels of significance individually. So probably the study were also underpowered or not long enough. But when you are going to mortality or uh, all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, you see a clear different picture. Small decrease in advanced study, significant increase in the accord study, and borderline increase not reaching levels of significance in the veteran study. So you see here again the endpoints. And what was different in these three studies? As you can see, in all three studies, there was a huge increase in severe hypoglycemia needing uh, IV glucose or glucagon. So many of these patients were unconsciousness. And as you can see, there was also a clear difference in the basal situation. Why? In the advanced study, about one third came from China. They needed insulin only 1.5%. Whereas in the Accord and Veteran study, 35 or half of the patients were on, already on insulin. And at the end of the trial, 90% in the Veteran study, almost 80% in the Accord study, but only 40% in the Advanced study had, a severe, had insulin treatment. So it is suspected that hypoglycemia was involved, uh, and it's difficult to uh, confirm hypoglycemia as cause of sudden tests. Of course, it's very difficult, but there are many cases with sudden tests in all these studies. So this is an unpublished um, uh, analysis of all these drugs 
uh, which were used in their court study. And you can see, and it's quite nice, that in the exenodite group there was a risk reduction, whereas in the insulin arm there was an increase, uh, a clear increase. Of course, it's difficult if you have so many drugs, so you can't publish this data. But anyway, it's very interesting, and I would say it's hypothesis uh, generating. So let's move to some uh, deeper insights. If you go to the ACCORD study, you see quite nice that patients with no previous cardiovascular events had a significant benefit, whereas those who had already cardiovascular did not benefit. And the same is the case for HbA1c. So if you have a low HbA1c, then you have a benefit. And as you know, the, uh, the advanced study had a much lower HbA1c. So if the diabetes is too advanced, too long duration of diabetes, and you have cardiovascular disease, it makes no sense to bring down glucose to very low levels. But, and this is very important, if you go to, again, to Australia, to the um, advanced study, here you see a very nice uh, publication by Sophia Tsungas, published recently in Diabetologia. You see different thresholds. So for microvascular disease, you can go very to very low levels, 6.5, whereas for major macrovascular events, or so all because there's the threshold is higher. It's about 7.2%, which is in line with the data published by Craig Curry in Lancet for a very large UK uh, patient group. So let's, uh, let, uh, please allow me to go for one slide to Proactive. I was involved in the Proactive. We published many papers. And uh, as you can see here, 50% of all these patients had uh, myocardial infarction. So in this uh, 2,455 patients, uh, interesting enough, bioglitazone reduced the risk for reinfarction by almost 30% and reduced, which I will not show, acute coronary syndrome by 37%. When Ray made a meta-analysis for the effect of intensive glucose lowering on the risk, uh, on the event rate of non-fatal myocardial infarction, then he could nicely show, and this is very important, a risk reduction by 17%, reaching levels of significance. So you cannot reduce mortality, but you can reduce non-fatal myocardial infarction. And the question is, of course, when you would follow up these patients for 10 years, whether you would not have also a risk reduction in the mortality. I believe yes. So five years is not long enough, of course. So Turnbull and uh, co-workers made also a very nice uh, uh, meta-analysis published in Diabetologia, and they also showed that the effect of intensive glucose control is different when you're analyzing the three studies together, Accord Advanced and Veteran Study. You have a benefit in patients uh, with absence of macrovascular disease, whereas this effect is uh, not uh, apparent when the patients have already macrovascular disease. Let's move finally to the origin study. The origin study is a very large study and will test whether basal insulin has an effect as on. Uh, it's uh, very different from the ACCORD study. It's not using a large variety of drugs. And uh, the type of patients included in origin are also very different from ACCORD and ADVANCE. I'll show it in a minute. So it's important to add by saying that the, these patients will have relative early stage of type 2 diabetes. 20% will not have, do not have diabetes, and duration of diabetes is quite short. It's half of the other studies, five years. And it's also important that the initial glucose level is much lower. It's very similar as in Tigami, or even lower, 6.5%. And um, up to now, uh, the interim analysis showed that the lowering of HbA1c is only half percent, also 0.5 percent. So it's the question remains whether insulin itself will change the macrovascular risk or not. You see here the trial. So they are also adding omega-3 in two arms versus placebo. And you have here standard treatment in yellow and glutchin. This is basal insulin in uh, blue. So here you see a summary of all the available trials, the differences, uh, and as you can see here in yellow, diabetes duration is much shorter. 20% do not have diabetes. 
The presence of macrovascular disease is 66 percent. It's lower compared to proactive, but much higher compared to the other three trials. And the baseline HP1C is quite low, is only 6.5 percent. So at the end of my talk, I will tell you that during the last 25 years, there was an enormous improvement in the prognosis of diabetic patients. So amputation rate significantly declined, blindness declined by 70%, uh, cardiovascular mortality declined by 60%. So half of the epidemic of the pan epidemic of type 2 diabetes is not caused by an increased incidence, it's caused by longer survival. And this is, I would say, a very good signal. This is caused by lipid lowering therapy, by uh, uh, antihypertensive treatment. Personally, I believe it's also uh, caused by glucose lowering. I know many patients with diabetes duration for more than 30 years who are totally healthy, have no signals of microbial, no eye disease, no heart disease, and they are relatively well controlled for all cardiovascular risk factors. So I have summarized uh, two years ago the mortality rate. And as you can see here, the ACWA trial and the advanced trial who had included patients in one third with cardiovascular disease, they have a much lower mortality as the UKBDS patients who were newly diagnosed and newly treated. So there's a clear decline in the mortality also when you're looking at the mortality per 1,000 patient years over the time. So uh, are we at the end of the potential intervention? Probably not. Probably some of the problems were caused by the use of the wrong uh, drugs. I'm not sure whether insulin and sulfonurias are the ideal drugs for patients with heart disease. And as you can see here, during the last 10 years, many new drugs were developed. And uh, it's of interest that some of these drugs are showing in interim analysis compared to other drugs, mainly subvenurias, a much better situation concerning cardiovascular risk factor reduction, cardiovascular risk endpoints. These are endpoints, but of course, very low numbers since these are patients uh, in the randomized uh, uh, trials. The same is the case for the GLP-1 agonists. It's also going on the uh, left side, as you can see here. And the same is the case for a new class, so-called SGLT2 inhibitors. We were recently approved by the European um, uh, Medical uh, uh, um, EMEA in London. So, uh, of course, we have to wait for the outcome of these 120,000 uh, patients involved in about 20 different trials. As you can see, we will have many trials with gliptins in red or with GLP-1 agonists in blue or with uh, uh, glitazar or the origin study or even with pioglitazone. So, I'm coming to my final slide. At the moment, evidence is lacking that intensive glucose-lowering strategies uh, in particular with insulin infusion, um, can improve the outcome in patients with acute myocardial infarction or established coronary artery disease. But this does not mean, does, uh, since uh, evidence does not exist, that in the future there will be no evidence that with new drugs you can improve the situation, for example, with GLP-1 agonists, since there are many interesting data, intensive care units with GLP-1 agonists. However, long-term optimal control, starting from diagnosis of diabetes, seems to significantly reduce all cause and cardiovascular mortality of patients with both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And ongoing outcome studies, including many new anti-diabetic drugs performed in more than 120,000 patients, will hopefully bring answer to many open questions concerning prevention or protection of progression of cardiovascular disease in diabetic patients. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so uh, let's go with the questions for the first two speakers. So, uh, if any questions from the audience, please. If not, I can start myself. So, this is a question addressed to Dr. Professor Peter Grant. Um, he was talking about the rigidity 
of the of the fibrin that was related with the glycemic control. Uh, I, I could understand. So, um, and it was reversible. Uh, in which, uh, in how long it was, was it reversible? Well, <clears throat> we carried out a study where we improved glycemic control in young type 1 diabetes patients over a two-month period. And uh, over that two-month period, they dropped their HbA1c about 1.5%. And it, it, it reversed the, um, uh, the structure function abnormalities back towards normal over that period of time. What we haven't done is a time course. So we haven't tested it on a weekly basis over a period of time to see when it takes place. But there's definite changes over a two-month period with improved glycemic control. OK. And in the other side, um, PA1 activity and also TPA was related to, um, to hyperinsulinemia. And, yeah. Into insulin resistance, uh, yeah. yes. Okay, insulin resistance. So yes. what is the role of the potential role of exogenous uh, insulin in this case? Well, um, I, I doubt that insulin has a role in this, actually. I think that the underlying problem is insulin resistance, and elevated levels of insulin are a surrogate for increased insulin resistance. There's a little bit of evidence that if you put insulin onto hepatic cells, they produce more PI-1. But I don't think that's really relevant to the issue of cardiovascular disease that we're talking about, where more of the PI-1 comes from the adipocyte and from endothelium that's causing the, the issue. And you don't get release with insulin from those cell types. OK, thank you. I have a question for Dr. Shantaner. I would like to know what is your position, what is your appraisal to the metabolic surgery? Yes. The bariatric surgery applied to diabetes and all this. I presented a lecture last week since we are doing a lot of study. We have experience in about 1,000 patients, and half of the patients do not have any metabolic abnormalities. They are totally healthy. And as you can see in the outcome study of last Thursday, published recently in, in JAMA, the patients without diabetes and without high insulin levels did not have any benefit in cardiovascular disease. So the whole study was only positive since 300 of the 2,000 patients were diabetic patients. So in our hands, we are operating patients with a BMI above 40, and uh, the patients should have a short duration of diabetes, less than five years. They should have high uh, basal insulin, otherwise they will not have remission. And the remission rate is related to the endogenous, uh, endogenous insulin production, of course. Yeah. So if a long uh, time diabetes, then it will not work. However, my institution started already before I was direct in this clinic, so that one of the oldest traditions in Europe, they started already in 1982, and the first publication in the PubMed was in 91. So we are seeing now a lot of long-term cases with severe uh, complications, uh, namely local complications in the gut system, in the bowel system. You need experts in in, in uh, surgery, otherwise you can't improve this. And at the moment, there's a discussion whether gastric bypass is still the best one, or we should move to um, uh, other types of operation. Uh, as you know, uh, there's a, a discussion. It's not as good for diabetic patients, but less uh, long-term side effects. You have many, many control visits are needed. Patients are uh, showing many abnormalities for vitamins, uh, for protein deficiency. So it's not uh, so without side effects, as said by some surgeons. Along the same lines, I have a question as well. This week, um, the first anti-obesity drug was approved in the United States. What do you anticipate to be the effects um, on, on diabetes and related syndromes? Uh, this is a very important question. So the dream drug would, of course, for all people, even without diabetes, to be slim for the whole life, not to become obese. So this would be the wonder drug. So all the available drugs uh, reduced body weight by only five kilograms. And five kilograms is not good enough for the majority of patients. They have a surplus of 30 kilograms or even more. Yeah? So it's better than nothing. And uh, you have to be uh, very careful for the long-term side effects. 
for the central nervous system, for uh, arrhythmia or so. Uh, I've not worked with this particular drug, but I've worked with all the other previous uh, uh, anti-obesity drugs. All were killed, all were stopped later on after some real world experience. So I'm not sure. In principle, it would be helpful, of course. Yeah? And uh, you would need a, a body reduction by about 10 kilogram to really prevent type 2 diabetes. So five kilogram is in the more obese Hopefully, Peter will agree, not really effective. So for the, for the real OPs, and most are real OPs. Uh, so the BMI changed a lot in the US. It's now 33 for type 2 diabetic patients. I don't know in Spain, but in Europe, it increased dramatically during the last two decades. Yeah? So we are far away from the, from the target value of normal BMI like you have. Yeah? <laughs> we have a question there? My question is could be uh, answered by either of the two uh, speakers. Th thank you very much for two excellent reviews. Uh, it is known that uh, diabetics have, have uh, uh, higher incidence of complications related to an increased uh, uh, proliferation of uh, smooth muscle cells, for example, or stenosis. You think that uh, 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 checking for uh, 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 proliferative retinopathy uh, could be used uh, as a kind of marker to predict which patients could uh, have more risk to these uh, complications and, and to tailor somewhat the therapy. This is a very interesting question related to our work since we did endothelial progenitor uh, cell studies in both in diabetic patients as well as in patients with cardiovascular disease, uh, hoping that we could find a differentiation. So in the advanced stages of diabetic retinopathy, you have an enormous increase of progenitor cells, uh, whereas in the cardiac patients, you have a decrease. Yeah? But in our study, we could not really differentiate uh, the two terms, the two types of uh, cells. I believe it's not helpful. To, to use uh, proliferative retinopathy. And proliferative retinopathy is now very uncommon in the diabetic patients. So if you look to a new uh, paper in diabetes care last month, it's very low compared to the old days, whereas heart disease is still very common, 20%, uh, 30%, depending on the cardiovascular corrector protection. So I believe uh, one is important. So Good glycemic control is reducing microvascular disease, and there are many studies showing that microvascular disease predict cardiovascular disease. So there is a relationship, of course, yeah, but you need many years for this relationship. 